micro, microbial, microbes, along with new chemistry, drone technology, sticky traps. You know, what is it that you can do to really control the infestation and multiplication of this pest? It is very difficult with all our efforts. We cannot guarantee that, you know, you can still produce good quality chili. So I run this very big project in different part of India. BT has been a savior to cotton industry in the country for last uh, 20, 22 years. It enabled India to become one of the biggest producer of cotton in last 25 years. But you know, with all the regulatory clearances given under Rule 89, which is the rule under EPA that actually regulates biotechnology in the country, you know, we have not been able to enforce those conditions in field conditions. And by not being able to enforce conditions of growing refugia, because we created conditions which were not amenable for farmer to really grow that non, the refuse around the cotton plants. And by creating these difficult conditions, we ensure that the tech reduce the life of the technology. And today, pink bollworm resistance is result of, you know, our conditions that we imposed on farming community. Had we allowed refuse in bag in early days of approval of BT cotton, today India would not have been facing the kind of problems that we are facing with cotton production. We are literally, if you really look at the magnitude, we are literally down with 10 million bales of cotton production annually. We peaked cotton production at 39 million bales in 2013, and today we are at 29 million bales, importing close to five to eight million bales of the cotton to meet the requirement of textile industry. The point that I'm sharing with you as a scientist is that the government regulation and the conditions that you impose you must see that these conditions can be implemented in field conditions. Otherwise, you're going to actually really not going to do the work that you intend to do. You know, genome editing may be a new technology, but we have seen in Indian agriculture for last 60 years, we have seen that the tools of molecular biology, whether you start with Green Revolution in 60s and 70s, it was all driven by single genes like RHT1, 2 in wheat and SD1 SD in rice that enabled India to really produce food and reduce the dependence on imported food. Green Revolution helped farmer adopt technologies beyond seed, whole nutrient management, pest management, mechanization, so plethora of technology that came al along with seeds actually during Green Revolution. And we have been able to, today you go to any part of the country, you will see short statured wheat and rice. That is helping all the new technologies that we are now putting into wheat and rice is basically on to the short statured rice and wheat. So that became the foundation of genetic stocks that we are using to see that you, know, you are building on what was a given during Green Revolution. Green Revolution technologies were not actually given to farmer without regulatory approvals. We had seed acts way back in 1966. By 1969, the seed act was implemented in India. You know, it was early 70s when we had this Green Revolution technology going into farmer, farmer's field. There is All India coordinated research projects which evaluate all kind of improved crop varieties was in place since 60s and 70s in different crops. So even Green Revolution technologies were very much regulated under government regulatory systems. Subsequently, you know, India was a country that was blessed with uh, scientists like you who actually identified the cytoplasmic male sterility and genetic male sterility mechanism whereby you can induce hybridization, the heterosis into cross-pollinated crops. And we've seen in 80s and late 90s revolution in vegetable production in the country. Those were produced in, in some specific area, started producing throughout the years. And today, 99% of what we consume is basically hybrid vegetables that we have. We also seen this heterosis implication 
in cotton. You know, it, wa it was way back in 70s that hybridization using emasculation and pollination control system where, which allowed women to actually earn a lot more money than what they used to earn because they are involved into the whole emasculation, emasculation pol pollination control system producing hybrid for the farming community. Also in sorghum, millets like pearl millet, I come from Western Rajasthan. You will not find single farmer who is growing straight varieties. All the farmer are doing are trying to see that how they can use best genetics with technologies that can. Hybridization was also regulated. It was not really that you know you give a seed free to farmer and things are done. Not not like that. So it was also regulated under seed acts and there was a uh, lot more conditions under AICRP um, that was put put together. Then you know in 2002 we have seen new era of BT technology. India was first country you know parallel to United States that we had these regulations that were put together in 1989 and we were able to released the first BT technology in 2002. Um, cotton, as I, I just now uh, you know, told you, it was a really a blessing in disguise for the farmer because they had huge issues to deal with um, you know, Helicoverpa armigera, the pest that uh, is very notorious. I can see a lot of my friends from African countries. Um, you know, we were seven, eight years later approving BT cotton. Um, you are 20 years late because now uh, countries like Ethiopia, um, Kenya, Swaziland, Nigeria, uh, Sudan, everyone is now uh, gearing to approve BT technology in cotton production system. You are also gearing to approve something on port border resistance, cowpea and other products, corn, uh, for example, in South Africa. Uh, but you know, that's where you know we are very, very, very late and we allow our food uh, that to be uh, produced for us is being eaten by pests and being destroyed by diseases. And I think that's where, you know, expediting the process, um, scientific scrutiny, and developing this public sentiments for the technology that Professor Swaminathan uh, has been able to do for drafting uh, rice and wheat. Uh, and that's where we need champion like Tanusari and uh, her director, actually, um, who can educate our public to see that um, those are being controlled. You know, BT technology approval was not easy. We had political will. We had a system under Rule 89. It was exactly what the coordinated systems that you have seen from the United States. Uh, they had three agencies involved. We got two agencies that are being working hand in gloves, uh, the Ministry of Environment, Forest, Climate Change, and Department of Biotechnology. Um, and this is where, you know, you have one law which is being actually administered by two different ministries. I think that's a very unique in the world, that you have two different ministries implementing one law issued by one particular ministry. So we have fantastic regulatory system put in place. Um, Viva will show you all the slides about how, you know, and what kind of studies being to be carried out, what are the regulatory agencies we have in India. Uh, but I think we were blessed that we had a political will in 2022, uh, 2002 that we got uh, the f first product approved. But you know, contrary to 180 days approval that you've seen from United States, our BT product was started in 1995. So it took us seven years. So you can actually do a little maths, you know, seven into 365. You know, that's how the uh, turnover period that we have for biotechnology application in the country. Unfortunately, um, for Dr. Deepak Pentel's mustard, uh, this is actually 23 years in row that we have not been able to help him to get the products that he developed way back in 2001. Uh, and that's where, you know, I think it, it, is, um, it is us, you know, a researcher and scientist, um, administrators, bureaucrats, that we have not been able to really convince uh, the public um, uh, to really look into some of the products uh, that can be transformative for Indian agriculture. Genome editing, I want to come to the fourth revolution that I see unfolding in Indian agriculture. We actually got, we got into action only in 2020 when the Department of Biotechnology came out with the draft regulatory, regulate, uh, regulatory guideline. It was a common guideline for agriculture, health, animal, microbes, for everything. 
And that's where the scientific com community got fumbled, that how could a guideline uh, that would suffice for uh, different area sectors of uh, application of this technology. And it was National Academy of Agriculture Sciences under the leadership of Dr. R.B. Singh, Paroda, Dr. Mahapatra, A.K. Singh, uh, all these people in agriculture science in India, they sat together uh, sometime in mid of 2020 uh, in the National Academy and they reviewed this particular guideline. And I think the recommendation from National Academy of Agriculture Sciences uh, was so critical uh, to see what we see, you know, very fast on use of genome edit edited products in the country. You know, in three years' time, from 2020, the National Academy issuing statements, uh, and today, I think we not only have a so-called exemptions on the first two category of genome edited products, SDN1 and 2, uh, I don't call them exem exemptions because there is nothing called exemptions, but they would not be subjected to advanced regulatory trialing, going to uh, get an, going to seek NOC from states to conduct trials and all that. So they would be actually regulated, and Viva is going to really tell you ex exactly how, at what level they would exit from the regulatory system. But I think that particular exemption idea is very good because that's where you know we can make a lot of difference. And using this SDN 1 and 2 uh, so-called exemptions, I think I would really call upon all of you to really look at some of the priority crops and traits that I believe, I believe uh, and I bring the whole uh, field knowledge to you guys, are very, very important for India's um, agriculture uh, transformation in the future. Some of the products that I believe that we can work on, and I, I want to start with, sir, I'll take a few more minutes. Eh? I start with cotton. I know developing insect resistance through genome editing is a tough nut. It's not that easy job. I know that. So what is it that we should look at into a fiber crop that is uh, the mainstay of income of large number of farmer and textile industry in the country? So I think some of the very important area that I understand from the field and the first mo foremost is that we must bring in something where we can impart tolerance to leaf curl virus. You know, leaf curl virus being transmitted through whitefly is a very big problem for all the cotton that we produce in northern part of the country, uh, Punjab, Haryana, Rajasthan. I think this is one of the single important trade that can help us to, you know, do better. The second most important virus resistance that we need in cotton is tobacco street virus. And I think this is the virus that is prevalent now for the last two, three years in southern part of the country and have been, you know, devastating farmer uh, on the top of what being, uh, you know, what they lose to the pink bollworm. So that's the second important viral disease that we are, you know, inflicted and we need to really do something using whatever technology that, that you can deploy. In cotton, I think what I've noticed in the last three years of my very extensive work is that because of the climate, climate change induced weather changes, I've seen huge difficulties with farmer to deal with wilt problem. Wilt is becoming very much prevalent all across three cotton growing areas in the country. And I think finally, I believe the ball rot is something, again, because of untimely rain, we face big problem with it. So these are the four important traits that I believe that if our people can put together their mind can be very, very useful. I would like to look at another very important crop where India is hugely deficit is edible oil production. You know, to your surprise, we import $20 billion worth of edible oil, cooking oil. $20 billion every year. You know, no one can, you know, grapple this enormity of edible oil import. $20 billion is 1 lakh, 1.65 lakh crore rupees. The whole ICR DBT budget is 6,000 crore. 1.65 lakh crore rupees ka, we are importing edible oil. And country, India, with 
vast agroclimatic zones, multiple oil seed crops, primary and secondary. We have not been able to do anything to transform our edible oil production in the country. Dr. Deepak Pantel is struggling, as I, as I, I told you. But what, what, we ca what can we do with genome editing? So crop like mustard, I come from Rajasthan. We grow crop in sandy soil. We have a huge problem with a parasitic weed called Aura Banki. You know, I'm sure, you know, with all the genetic maps available of mustard, the Brassica juncia, I'm sure you can find out the regions why this particular parasite grows at the time of flowering. The same parasite is creating problem in cumin, which is one of the second biggest exportable spices that we have from the, from the country. It's such a, it's emerging as a very big problem. We have issues with increasing oil percentage oil in crop like mustard. We have a similar problem with weeds in soya bean. You know, I think Tanu is working on a lot of these herbicide tolerant uh, products, uh, but you know, these products are the one that has to really reach to the farming community. I think one of the other examples that I would like to quote here is about spices that I work on. You know, we grow this spice crop called fennel. Soft. Aap khate ho na digestion ke liye. It's been grown on a very large track in state of Rajasthan and Gujarat. That's a fennel. We face huge problem with this disease called gumosis. Uh, not many people would really know. So I think, you know, similarly, you know, I have a list of crops. I don't want to really, because there are a lot of foreigners here, they won't really know what we are doing in India. But what I'm trying to convey to you is that prioritizing crop and trades is paramount for us to address the challenges that farmers are facing. I think one more issue that I would like to address here, you know, any of the crops that you would like to investigate, how do you select the genetic stock? You know, Tanu would ask me to, Bhagira, send me GC4. Send me PM30 mustard seed. I will transform them with my genetic CRISPR tools. But shouldn't we have a national policy on what are the genetic stocks in a particular crop that we must use to transform should we look at high yielding? Should we look at the national check? Should we look at something like cocker of cotton, what you've done in cotton? So I think one brainstorming on which genetic stocks, the germplasm, should we use native? Or we use the adaptable germplasm? Should we use the germplasm that it works as a one male parent or female parent? I don't know. But I think one of the, you know, along with this prioritizing, I think genetic selection of genetic, and I think that's where DBT and ICR must come out with brainstorming and look at on various crop and traits that you are looking at, what should be the genetic stocks that you should be using? Because I believe at this point of time, everything is very haphazard. Random, jo available hai, whether it's a nuclear seed, no one knows, because many of them are using commercial grain collect karke, Amazon se order deke kar rahe ho. I don't think that's a real way that, so, so, so second, in this regard, I think selection of particular germplasm. I think third very important because India is becoming a, a smart player in the global agriculture trade commodity. Uh, last year we achieved, um, I, I completed my four years of APIDA board membership recently, but during my board membership, we were blessed that we have achieved $50 billion worth of export from the country which is actually nothing because international agriculture commodity trade trade is $2 trillion. Still, we are 2% of what we can do it. But we have huge opportunity to export uh, some of the, uh, uh, whether it's a millets or maybe uh, cereals or oil seed or whatever you call it, spices. So another thing that we must be very careful is that those countries which import from India. So 
whether they have the regulation on genetic modification or not. Because you don't want to do something that would spoil your trade, actually. That's something that we must be really prepared and think much ahead than what we could do. I think one more issue that I would like to look at is, which I ask uh, Bob also, you know, you know, raise your hand if you have a freedom to operate on the CRISPR that you use in India. Everyone is using it. You have a freedom to operate? Can you commercialize? No. So no one in my country, not only you, we'll come back to you, yeah. So whether we have, so what, are, what is it that we are developing? Whether we, we would be able to commercialize it or not? How we are going to do it? Who is going to fund that money, licensing, to the technology providers? You might actually, you might do some insertions or knockout. Uh, you might change uh, some base pair. Uh, you know what changes that you've done. And you can also seek intellectual property on it under PVP, FRA. That's fantastic. But the tool that you use to do it, whether you have the freedom to operate on that or not. I think that's also, I think this is also a national issue. We have to also look at what are the intellectual properties being given to CRISPR in India, in the country. Do we know what is it that is being covered and what is, are the gray areas that we can look into? I think these are some of the very important issue that comes from my heart because I work with the farming community. I know what uh, it can do. And I believe with the regulatory framework that Vibha is going to share with you, I think it's much more enabling than what we have seen on BT biotechnology. Um, and I think uh, that's where you know, it's, you know, all of you and us collectively, how we can accelerate the process, addressing the challenges that I just shared with you, and see that you know, new technologies uh, can be used, deployed, to address some of the big challenges that I just now shared with you. I want to really thank you uh, so much. I know uh, Rishi Sir is looking at me. <laughs> and uh, I appreciate all the best to you guys, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you, Bhagirat, uh, for a nice presentation. In fact, uh, you have painted a canvas from the Green Revolution to Genome Editing and uh, you were also reminded of those uh, technologies which we have forgotten almost uh, in the name of the genome editing today. Uh, and uh, you have raised very pertinent issues. And um, uh, <coughs> these issues should be, as you mentioned, the brainstormed at the national level. And the different countries have different issues. So um, I end up here with this presentation and uh, uh, with the maintaining the. Uh, any question is there to Bhagirath? Yes, one question, uh, I see one hand there. Just quickly, please. Can you come here? Thank you so much. <coughs> I've grasped a lot of things from your speech. And uh, I hope I come from Ethiopia. I have a general question. That is uh, about the GMO principle or the rule. So uh, there is a different rule for Europe and for uh, USA as well as for different countries like uh, Asia or Africa. Since the GMO produce or some crop is, it is bred or edited, and all the human people being on the world, some consume it, why we don't have same rule? For example, in the case of Europe, we can say some GMO edit is not considered as a GMO. In the case of the, U the USA, you s we say it is not. Uh, for example, in Asia, some can be uh, co cannot consider as a GMO, but it is bred. Yeah, yeah, I I so got why, it. Why we don't have yeah, I can same rule? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I I hope you got it, right? He's asking why don't we have a uniform regulatory system on genetically modified crops across the world? Very good. 
Ideally, it should be. Because this is a science which is same everywhere in the world. Harmonization of the regulation is a talk that I have been hearing for last, since the you know, first product was introduced in 1996. But you know, every sovereign country has the right to produce regulations that they feel that it's deemed appropriate for their public. And I think that's where, you know, in the past when we did not have a regulation, that's why the United Nations has came out with the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, that the countries that they don't have a regulation, and if a product is coming from another country where it is being officially approved, how do you trade that product? Okay, so there was a protocol. But majority of the country now in the world, they have their own regulation. I think we have broad understanding on major you know, biosafety parameters, whether it is toxicity, allergenicity, nutritional composition, I think it's almost uniform across the world. But some countries like India, um, we may have a uniformity with the US regulatory system on uh, these parameters, but when we were evaluating BT cotton, we ensured that it is also being fed to animals. Because there was not regulation in the US, but we feed cotton, you know, the oil cake to the animal. So different circumstances, uh, different use patterns, uh, you know, it's, I think, demand countries to have independent regulatory systems. But more importantly, can we have similar evaluation duration? Like USA 180. I said in India, Deepak Pantel is struggling with 9,000 days now. <laughs> it's a <laughs> so, so, so that's where, you know, we have a problem. But I think uh, it's good that harmonization of the and I think that is what I've seen in genome edited products because I see broadly that a product which can be made free of transgene using CRISPR technology would be exempted in almost all the countries. You know, that's how the regulation is evolving that I see. Thank you. Uh, thank you.